Hello, everyone, and welcome to the seventh ever Highlight Haven interview. My name is Matthew Heiserman, and today we are joined by a very special guest. He is a sports reporter, host, and analyst for CBS. Let me welcome Evan Washburn to the show. It's great to have you on. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get right into it. You went to college at the University of Delaware, where you were a star at lacrosse. Can you explain how being involved with sports at a young age helped you as a broadcaster later down the road? It's a great question. I I really lean on it daily, and especially when I'm at events, covering games, dealing with coaches and athletes, because I'm a firm believer that no matter what level you played or what sport you played, If you're able to make it to being a collegiate athlete, you understand the discipline required, the work required to be successful at a high level at at something. So that kind of gives you uh, a different respect for what the athletes and coaches you're covering at the professional level or at the collegiate level, if you're covering high level college football or basketball, are going through. So I connect in a way that I feel like some folks that maybe didn't play collegiate sports aren't able to. It's not to say they can't do the job the way I do it, but it's definitely something that makes me more comfortable in that environment. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you've been able to call many Super Bowls throughout your career. What was it, what was going through your mind during that first Super Bowl that you covered, knowing that you were on one of the biggest stages in all of sports? Man, there were a lot of nerves and uh, I don't, I'm not afraid to say that there was a great amount of appreciation for the moment, but there was definitely some fear involved. But what I always think about that's so cool about, especially that first one, is that once you kind of get through the first wave of anxiety, nerves, fear, you do your first report, whatever your first responsibility on the broadcast, things slow down and it feels sort of normal. And the game itself is unlike any other, and not because Mm -hmm hundreds of millions of people are watching it, but because it's not as rabid an environment as you'll experience really on a normal Sunday, but even in the playoffs, because you think about it, it's a neutral site. You've got two different fan bases there. So it it provides almost an even more comforting environment to thinking it's not that big a deal, even though it's the biggest game of the year. Yeah. And which one would you say has been your favorite Super Bowl to cover that you have covered? Uh, yeah, I, it's, I'm sure it's being a little bit uh, prisoner of the moment, but the most recent one probably has to be atop mm-hmm. the list for a number of factors. One, it was the most exciting game, and that's really what matters uh, at the end of the day. It went to overtime. It was the most watched event telecast of all time, so that layer to it's definitely kind of cool, too, just from an ego side of things. So I would say the most recent one was probably – and I was – I'm comfortable enough now in those big game environments to now enjoy it in a different way. I'm still nervous because I think if you're not nervous, it means you don't care. And if you don't care, then there's a problem. So I I think nerves are a healthy thing to have. It can't be damaging to your performance, but it's okay to be a little bit nervous. Uh, So that, that last one, I was just the right amount of nervous, but also enough in terms of confidence to, to be able to appreciate the moment. Yeah, and obviously it's hard not to appreciate that overtime ending that you were able to see with the Chiefs game-winning touchdown. Now, most of the broadcasting you do is obviously on camera. When you're on camera, what are some tips and tricks that you use to ensure that you have good camera presence? Another great question. Uh, I I think, one, it it just comes down to reps because the goal is Mm -hmm. to be comfortable and to not just be comfortable, but appear comfortable and make sure that the way that you would talk to your friends or your family, if there wasn't a camera in terms of pace and the cadence that you use, the style in which you speak is as similar as possible to the way you are when you are on camera, because it goes back to the most important word, are you being authentic? And viewers really respond to people being authentic on camera. But it's not as easy to just be that because you have to think about what you're saying. You've got somebody in your ear telling you to wrap it up or to keep talking or giving you some other command. So there's a lot happening. There's distractions everywhere. So out of the gate, there's definitely a tenseness. There's this idea that I have to memorize what I'm going to say so I say it perfectly. 
And I think over time, at least for me, I've gotten to a place where I do those things. I'm able to feel comfortable with those things while also being myself a little bit elevated because there is, and somebody early in my career gave me this idea, whoever you are, just add five to 10% in terms of punch because you do need that to cut through sometimes the screen or the, the speaker so that people are, their attention is grabbed. So I would say the best practice is practice, repetition. But at the end of the day, if it's you, Matthew, you have to be you on camera, the same you you are when there's no camera. And maybe you enhance it a little bit just to project and, and, and be a little bit more energetic. Yeah. Now, does it specifically stress you out when you're maybe talking into the camera, then you have your producer, maybe you're hearing fans in the background. What is that like? Stress is probably a bit strong. It's, mm -hmm. it's challenging at times mm -hmm. because your brain is going to, if someone's talking to you in your ear while you're talking, have to deal with that information. Fans don't bother me as much anymore. I kind of got, I actually enjoy it because it, it neutralizes or it kind of makes the environment seem crazy. So anything can happen and it takes the idea of being perfect out of the window or out of the uh, equation. And so that, that, that to me sometimes is comforting. I like those crazy environments as long as you can hear yourself. <laughs> sometimes that's not possible. The producer thinks tough. I was just doing a, a broadcast for the Ravens and I was part of the pregame show. So as the host of the pregame show, you got to get to commercial and the producers counting you to commercial so that you kind of, we call it hit the post in broadcasting where ideally you're wrapping up your thought and teasing or punching to commercial as the producer saying two and one, maybe you give a second just to like let it bleed or breathe a little bit before the commercial. But it's hard because you're hearing the countdown while you're trying to really nail, as we say, the post. Yeah. Uh, and that, that, that can be tough. But like I say, or I keep saying, it comes down to, to practice. And the more reps you get at it, the more normal it starts to feel. Yeah, absolutely. And throughout your career, you've gotten to meet many players, cover, cover incredible games and everything in between. Has there been a specific moment as a broadcaster that really stood out to you as your favorite or most memorable? Right. I've been really fortunate. I've been a part of a lot of cool moments, whether it's NFL, NCAA tournament really provides a lot. I, mean, it, I know NFL is probably where I'm known to be associated mostly, but the NCAA tournament, there's so many crazy things that happen over the course of that two week period where I'm covering it from buzzer beaters to upsets. And those are, those are some of the cooler moments because you also have younger, younger folks and, and yeah. so they appreciate the moment in a different way than professionals do. But if, if you want a true example, I always go back to the 2019 AFC championship game uh, Chiefs Patriots where it was the before Mahomes and the Chiefs had won a Super Bowl and the Patriots it was their last hurrah went to overtime she uh, the Patriots won in Kansas City super cold environment at night and I did a post-game interview with Tom Brady on the field and he was completely lost in emotion uh, cursed a couple times which was pretty I thought pretty funny because He's about as polished a, a guy as you'll find, especially at that point in his career. But he was in such a joyful moment that he couldn't help himself. So that, that to me, has always stu stood out as probably the coolest interaction uh, in, a small, in a small sort of scenario that I've experienced thus far. Yeah, and speaking of the Chiefs, on September 5th, the NFL kicks off with a game between the Baltimore Ravens and the Kansas City Chiefs. This, of course, will be a rematch of the AFC Championship game last year and could potentially be one of the best games during this NFL season. What is your prediction heading into that matchup? And obviously, you could talk a lot of Ravens as you live in Maryland right now. And Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and been around the, the Ravens a bunch this preseason, yeah. call them, being part of their preseason broadcast. Know the Chiefs well – as well. And those kickoff games are awesome, but they almost stand alone. I don't think they're a true indicator 
necessarily of who teams are or will be over the course of the season. Now, that being said, last year, Kansas City was in this game and lost to the Detroit Lions, and it was a real launching point for the Lions. They went on to have an incredible season, a couple of plays away from making it to a Super Bowl to maybe play Kansas City. But I remember after that Kansas City lost, people were like, oh, the Chiefs are down. This is going to be a rebuilding year. And there were moments where that looked to be true. But then at the end of the season, they're, they're hoisting the Lombardi. So all that said, I think this will be a game where I probably lean more towards Kansas City because they have so much continuity. Now, they are going to employ new pieces, both offensively and defensively. But staff and key components to both sides of the ball return from the Super Bowl team. And I think that does matter, especially early in the season. This Ravens team, while they have Lamar back, they've got Mark Andrews, they've got Zay Flowers, they've got Roquan, Kyle Hamilton, Marlon, those anchor pieces on both sides. A lot a lot of change, both in the staff, new defensive coordinator and Zach Hoare taking over, three offensive line spots that are still in flux. That's a big part of the offensive line. So I just think based off of all those situations, I, I would probably lean more towards Kansas City. Also, it's in Kansas City, all those things. But I expect it to be an extremely entertaining, probably tight game because most NFL games are. And look, the, the excitement for week one provides so much. So uh, it, it's hard for it to disappoint. Yeah, obviously Arrow had one of the most electric stadiums in the NFL, but recently we've seen tons of injuries in preseason training camp practices. Clearly it's putting players' health and safety at risk. Do you think players should be forced to participate in these activities even with possible injury concerns? Well, I'd say at least in the games, mm-hmm. we're starting to see most starters not playing at all. Baltimore didn't play any of their key guys for any of the three games. It's now more of an outlier if starters are going to play in the preseason in the games. Now, practice is important. That's even taken a step back. There's a lot less practice than there was even a few years ago. That's been collectively bargained, and coaches and staffs are very careful, especially with older players, how they manage them. I kind of come down on it, Matthew, that you can't – it's a physical game. It's a sport that even as much as they've tailored the rules for health and safety, which I think at the end of the day is very important, it's a physical game. It's a violent game. And to play it well and efficiently, and it requires everybody to be on the same page and working together on either side of the ball, it's kind of like broadcasting. You have to get reps. So at some point, they're going to have to practice. At some point, they're going to have to play because in week one here in a few weeks, it's going to matter. And if they don't play well, they're going to be pretty disappointed with the outcome or the performance. So I would say within reason, both in the games, which again, most teams aren't playing anybody, and also in practices, no matter how experienced you are, there's a real value to playing the position and playing the sport in the preseason, in training camp, because also because it's so interconnected positionally, even if you're a vet that maybe doesn't need the practice reps, you being on the field. So let's use Lamar Jackson, for example. Lamar playing in certain scenarios with some of the younger guys is important so that they can understand how Lamar plays and how he wants them to play. So when Lamar sits out or if he's to sit out, then that impacts a young player's development because he doesn't get the chance to play with Lamar. And then all of a sudden he's thrust into a scenario in week two or week four, and he's barely played with them and their timing's off. So all this is part of the really challenging spot that coaches mostly find themselves in. How do I get my team ready for week one and real games while also making sure my key players and really my entire roster as best I can stays healthy? I don't think there's a perfect answer for it. Yeah, and another reason that we've seen so many players out recently also has to do with contracts. Holding out has been become extremely common, and we've seen stars such as Hassan Reddick, Brandon Ayuk, and C.D. Lamb all doing so. What is your stance on the situation? Now, I will say the C.D. Lamb one won't continue because he did get paid today, but we've still seen it become a very common trend. (laughs) No, it's a, it's a great point. It's a really interesting storyline that I think is really 
developed in the last mm. year or two, these hold ins, as you put it, which is the, I guess, the proper term. And it allows the player to not be fined while also continuing to hold their services back. Or that's where I'm kind of, I'm not a huge fan of it because it's basically getting your cake and eating it too, where you're not playing, but you don't get punished for not playing. And it sets an odd visual too, where if you go to these practices and a guy's just kind of sitting on the sideline, not doing it, but teams seem to prefer it more because they're engaged in meetings, all those things. So if I were running a team as a front office, uh, whether GM, coach, and, and how that their owner, how the inner dynamics work there with contracts with, with players, it would be a situation where it's like, hey, let's let's really do all we can in the period leading up to training camp to get a deal done. And if we can't get a deal done in training camp, we can continue to talk about it, but I'm not a big fan of you being here if you're not going to participate the way that we expect everybody else to participate. Because it kind of goes back to that team, being a part of team sports. I'm just such a believer that no matter how high level you are, you're part of a team and everybody's kind of have to put in the same amount of effort and kind of be part of the process. So, look, I, I know it, it's much more challenging than probably you and I understand as we try to simplify it here. but I would like to see scenarios where there's more urgency to get things done before training camp. So it just doesn't become a conversation throughout what it's ended up being about a six week season before the season starts. Yeah. And we're going to start wrapping things up soon, but I do want to ask recently, you've been able to interview both Miles Garrett and Justin Jefferson and ask them who their starting five would be in basketball made up of all NFL players. I wanted to ask you the same question and see what your lineup would look like. Oh, it's a good one. Good one, Matthew. Um, well, I'm going to go with Miles. I'm going to go with Justin mm -hmm. Jefferson. Okay. I'm going to go with Devontae Adams because they, they I, I didn't know this, but I guess he can really hoop. And they both had him in their, in their group. I liked – they had Mahomes and Burrow coming off the bench. I think I want one of them in 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 the action. I'm going to go with Mahomes just because mm -hmm. the man can do no wrong. And I think if you've got Mahomes on the court, he's going to make the right play, mm -hmm. whether it's passing the ball in transition or making a play as, as a guy who's got some size too. He's going to grind with you in there. Uh, so that's four. I'm trying to think who my fifth would be. Maybe DK Metcalf, who showed off his athleticism at yeah, the no, it's NBA. Yeah, call. You throw it up there. He's probably going to be able to put it down. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to think if there's anybody I'm not thinking of that would provide um, a fun fun visual uh, yeah. or uh, or size discrepancy that could, could, again, give us the edge underneath. It would be like our Nikola Jokic if we could find one. Um, but, no, you're, I'll go with yours. DK Metcalf's mm -hmm. a good one. Uh, he can round out our group. So we're pretty athletic. We got Miles. We got DK probably on the blocks. Except I think Miles said he was play. He was like a three. So maybe DK is going to be or he'll Miles have to play four or five. So yeah, we're we're a bit smaller, but man, we're athletic. Yeah. Now I do have one final question to ask. If there was one piece of advice you could give to an aspiring sports broadcaster like me, what would it be? Well, you're way ahead of the game. So you should continue to do what you're doing. And what you just did or we are doing right now is, is a great rep for you. So the more that you can do what it is you want to be doing down the road professionally, the better off you're going to be. I also, and again, you're, you're already kind of on this path, but say yes to everything that <laughs> is even tangentially or closely connected to the world of broadcasting. Because as much as, Maybe you want to be a host of a show or a play-by-play -play person or a sideline reporter. All the kind of glamour, I call them jobs, the on-camera jobs. Those, That's great, and if that's your goal. But it's really important in this business, I think, to understand all the other jobs that go into it. Because to be honest with you, Matthew, sometimes we get way too much credit for doing it when there's so many people behind the scenes that – make it all happen, whether it's the producer in the truck, the director in the truck that's choosing the pictures, all the people that manage the graphics, the tape room, do all the cool replays, everything. 
they make everything look a certain way that then we can step into and try and, and star in or thrive in. So those jobs, if even if you don't end up doing them, understanding them, being in that those chairs, being behind a camera, learning how to shoot, it's 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 really really valuable. I I didn't do it for that long, but there was a period in my early portion of my career where I would take the camera from the TV station, I would go shoot the game, whether it was a lacrosse game or something here locally in Baltimore. And then go back to the TV station, put the tape into an edit machine. I would edit the highlights. I would also have to then shoot my own stand up. So set the camera up, go step in front of the camera, do the I'm a Washburn here reporting from Ravens camp. Also put that part, edit it all, and then be able to send it off. So I basically got to touch every part of the process. And it was invaluable because. One, it helped me understand how to tell stories and how to do things. But I would say most importantly now, it's given me such a respect for everybody else's job when I'm at an event or I'm on a show because I've in some form or fashion done what they've done. So I know how important it is. I know how challenging it is. So that would be my real main advice is just try and do as many things over the next for you let's call it 10 years as you continue through school and you're away from school and all those things, because it'll just make you such a more well-rounded broadcaster. Yeah, absolutely. With that being said, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I really do appreciate it. Is there anything else you want to say to the people watching before we wrap things up? No, just keep killing it. Uh, and everybody out there who is watching, uh, keep listening. I think they, what do they say? Depending on where you're putting this, uh, rate and subscribe. Subscribe and listen uh, to my guy. And uh, no, happy to be on. Look forward to doing it again soon. Yeah, again, big thanks to Evan Washburn for being the seventh ever Highlight Haven interview guest. And as always, we'll see you next time.